Hey everyone, uh, Jerry here from Llama Index. Um, we have another Llama Index webinar series today, and today we're excited to feature Avatar from Timescale Vector, and we'll be talking about time-based retrieval for RAG. So this is very interesting because I think for most uh, RAG-based systems, uh, you know, you don't really think about the concept of time, but I've actually heard this from a lot of users on how do you actually think about, you know, uh, well, one, like modeling and, and storing your data with, with time information, and then two, actually getting the LM to query the database with, with time information. Um, and so uh, lots of interesting concepts in here from both like the LM side as well as the system side. So I'm really excited to dive into this. Uh, and and Afro, do you want to take it away? For sure. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having us today. Uh, really excited to chat about this whole concept of time-based retrieval for, uh, for RAG and also some of the work that we've been doing at Timescale Vector in order to enable this. So... Uh, by way of introduction, you know, Jay mentioned, uh, my name is Aftar. Uh, I think my official title is like product lead for Timescale Vector, uh, but I really do a lot of things from, you know, writing code and examples that you're going to see today to, uh, you know, giving presentations like this. So really excited to chat to you all. I'm, I'm uh, speaking today from, from New York City. Um, let's get into an overview of what we're going to cover today. Here's a, a short agenda for, you know, what you can expect from today's presentation. Um, We'll start off with some motivation for what is time-based retrieval. Uh, you know, Jerry mentioned that a lot of the time uh, when folks think about RAG, they just think about, you know, similarity search and trying to structure your knowledge base in such a way that you get the best results. Uh, so I'll do some motivation for what is time-based retrieval and why it can be actually be helpful for your RAG systems. Uh, secondly, we'll take a look at some use cases that you can um, design in mind uh, with when you're actually building uh, RAG systems with time. Uh, and I'll actually cover a real world use case of a customer of Timescale today, uh, a company called Market Reader. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Uh, thirdly, I'll get into some of the technical challenges with performing time-based retrieval efficiently uh, that a lot of vector databases uh, run into. And then I'll cover the solution that we implemented with Timescale and Timescale Vector uh, and then I'll go into some of the code for how you can actually leverage this capability in Llama Index. So Timescale Vector has an integration in Llama Index, and uh, we make it really easy for you to take advantage of a lot of the uh, complex like systems level optimizations that we add uh, in really a few lines of code, as you'll see. Uh, finally, I'll get into a live demo. Uh, we just finished up uh, this uh, sample application that allows you to chat with uh, a Git commit, uh, your Git commit history. So I'll show you uh, that in action. Uh, that's built with Streamlit and and Llama Index and Timescale Vector. And then finally, we'll get into some Q and A. Uh, at any point during the session, you know, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll address them like uh, live if uh, if it's quick. But otherwise, you know, put it there and then we can deal with it at the end of today's session. So that's an overview of what you can expect today. Let's get started into the first part, which is what is time-based retrieval? So let's start with, uh, you know, motivating what is, uh, what is simple retrieval? I think this is the best place to start. Simple retrieval is basically when you uh, want to uh, retrieve records from your vector database that are most semantically similar to a given query. So this is kind of the basic RAG that, uh, many of us uh, have learned about. And then what you do is that once you retrieve those records, you can use that as context for an LLM completion query. And this is the uh, augment in the retrieval augmented generation uh, acronym. So that's simple retrieval. Now, the issue is that vectors are not, uh, vectors don't exist in a vacuum. This is uh, the alliteration that I came up with to explain the importance of metadata. So uh, often you don't just want the vector representation, but you want uh, the things that are associated with the vector. Vectors often represent chunks in documents. They represent user messages. These things have their own metadata associated with them. And it's often important for us to incorporate that into our queries and into our uh, RAG systems in order to get better results for users. So this is where uh, metadata comes in. And in particular, time as a metadata component. Now, I just mentioned your vectors, they're representing these real world things. They're documents, they're images, they're web pages. And often these things have a time associated with them. For example, you'll have a creation date of your document. You'll have a publishing date of like an article. You'd have a last updated uh, date for a web page on your website. So there's time associated with a lot of these things. And what you can actually do is leverage 
this in order to give users better results. So coming back to the definition, you know, what is time-based retrieval? The goal here with RAG is to give users the most relevant results possible. What we can do, the insight that we have is you can actually use time as a search filter to increase the relevancy of results. So uh, that gives rise to time-based retrieval where you retrieve vectors that are semantically most similar, but they're also pertinent to a specific time frame. And we'll see some examples in a minute about how you can constrain that time frame. So time-based retrieval is essentially a two-step process. Step number one is to perform a similarity search with a time filter, and then two, to pass on that context uh, that uh, both contains relevant information, but relevant within a specific time period to the LLM. Uh, so that's an overview of what is time-based retrieval. Let's get into, now that you understand a little bit about the concepts, some uh, applications and use cases for using them in your uh, RAG systems to give users better answers. So I'm going to uh, go through an overview of some of the use cases, how you can actually implement time-based retrieval today and like what kind of problems you can solve with it. So the first one is just search within a time range. So for example, sometimes, uh, you know, we're often building these uh, chat with your data, chat with your document, um, chat with your document kinds of applications. Uh, and so what you can do is filter documents by things like create date or last update date, or give the users the ability to constrain the search so that they can find the most relevant uh, relevant uh, documents. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is things like chat history. So when you're building these chatbots, often uh, you'd want to store the timestamp that the user sent the message or that the LLM uh, gave a uh, or the AI assistant gave a response. And so what you can actually do if you're building these chatbots and you want to do analytics and you want to do kind of analysis and summaries of a conversation, uh, you can search and retrieve chat history from a window of time in the past. And that's uh, one other capability that you can add with, uh, with time-based uh, retrieval. Thirdly, uh, one interesting use case is just to find the most recent embeddings. So for example, let's say, uh, you're building an application and you want to find the most recent news or social media posts related to a certain topic. Um, and this is, uh, you know, one of the main applications that we see, and I'll show you a real world user uh, in, a, in a moment. And then lastly, uh, you really can use it to give an LLM a sense of time. So you can ask time-based questions about a knowledge base. This is something that I'll demo for you uh, later on in the presentation. Um, using, uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, you basically give the LLM this tool to say, hey, you can make these time filters uh, and, and answer uh, these time-based questions. Um, Alex says in the chat, uh, he's using Slack chat history as one of the sources of knowledge, and he found that time-based retrieval in this case is a must, 100%. So that's another good example. Slack messages is is another one where, you know, and often the time is a is a is a marker of relevance. Uh, you know, we come back to this idea that we want to give users relevant results. Often you have messages that are very old that can be, uh, you know, less relevant than messages that are newer and sometimes vice versa. Sometimes you want to look at, you know, older documents to find out things and and uh, shun the newer documents. So that gives you this idea of like using time as a proxy for relevance uh, and implementing that in your systems. So outside of LLMs, uh, there's also some use cases I just wanted to mention. One is image similarity where you'd look at uh, the images that are most similar, but like from video in a certain time period. Um, and then lastly, anomaly detection, where you'd want to look at, uh, you know, anomalies, uh, you, you compare a certain vector to anomaly vectors uh, from uh, a specific time period back in order to see like, ah, is this actually an anomaly or do I need to take action on it? So these are some outside of LLM use cases that I thought might be interesting. Um, Okay, I wanted to talk to you about a real world company doing this. This is actually a customer of Timescale. So a little small disclaimer, but I thought the use case was very interesting. There's a company called Market Reader. Basically what they do is, uh, you know, their website says, know what's moving and why. What they do is they have um, a, a feed of asset prices. So they have this time series data of asset prices, stock prices. And what they do is they help users understand why is the market moving? So they see a certain movement in the market, the stock might go up and down. And then what they do is they want to find the most relevant news related to a specific market event. And so what they actually do is this uh, you know, time-based retrieval and action where 
they want to find the most pertinent news stories or news headlines related to a market movement, uh, but it needs to be recent. It needs to be in the in the in the last uh, you know five minutes or last thirty minutes or whatever time period that's interesting. And so this is a you know really um, a use case that exemplifies why time-based retrieval is important because you want to do a similarity search on the topic. Maybe it's a stock name or something like that, but you want to constrain that in the time period that's relevant uh, for uh, for the user, which is usually, you know, the past minutes or past hours or so. Okay, so uh, Alex also says, uh, you know, relevance in this case is key. Otherwise, LLM gets outdated and ends up hallucinating. 100% right. So thank you, Alex, for your comments. Really appreciate it. Um, cool. So now you can see this is an example of an actual company doing this. Uh, and, you know, some inspiration for how you can uh, do this in your uh, applications. Now, time-based retrieval sounds great. You know, why, why, why doesn't everyone use this? Why isn't this used more? Uh, let's get into some of the technical challenges and, and how we at, at Timescale um, propose a solution and, and what we implemented in Timescale Vector. So the challenge is that most vector databases don't handle time well. Um, you know, most vector databases, vector databases have kind of risen to fame this past year. Uh, there seems to be a new one popping up every day. And they handle vector data really well. You know, they have these a &N indexes, they have hybrid search capabilities, et cetera. But time seems to be something that they don't uh, handle very well. And uh, you know, that's mostly because they're specialized for vector search in itself. Now, uh, traditionally, there's two ways to deal with this. Uh, when you have a vector database and you want to do some variety search with time filters. And unfortunately, like both of these methods don't work in practice. So let's let's look at them one by one. The first one is this idea called post filtering, which is basically, you know, we talked about time-based uh, retrieval as a two-step process. One, you want to do your similarity search, uh, and then you want to have that um, represent the only the vectors in that specific period of time. While post filtering, what you do is you apply the time filter after similarity search. Now, uh, what this looks like is you'd find the similar embeddings. You'd filter out the ones not in the time range, and then you'd uh, remove, uh, then you'd return the results. Uh, I see Ahmed ask a question. I will answer that question in the Q&A part. So thank you, Ahmed. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get you in the Q&A. Okay, but back to post-filtering. So post-filtering, you find some embeddings, you filter out the ones not in the time range, and then you return the results. Now, most of you can probably see the problem with this, which is that when you do a similarity search, some of the results that you get might not fit in the time range that you're interested in. And so what happens is that you could end up with, uh, you know, in the best case, fewer results than you expect, or in some cases, no results, because all of the things that you've returned from finding the most similar vectors just fall out of the time range that you're interested in. So post-filtering is not, uh, you know, the, the best solution to use here. There's this idea of pre-filtering, which is applying the time filter before similarity search. And this kind of seems what we want. This seems like something that we want, where you constrain the search only to the vectors in the relevant time period, and then you perform the similarity search and return the results. Now, the problem here is that most vector databases aren't optimized for this kind of search, because what happens is uh, when you have an index on a collection or on a table or something like that, uh, the index is built over the entire set of vectors. And so in order to use the index, you need to uh, search the entire vector set. And obviously, um, you know, if uh, some folks might know a little bit about approximate nearest neighbor search, I won't get too much into it. But basically, there's all these uh, fancy methods to traverse graphs and things like that in, a, in an efficient way such that you can uh, search through millions and billions of vectors in a short period of time. But then again, those graphs and those things are built off the whole vector set uh, and so what happens is that if you want to filter out the, the data that's only relevant in your time period, what happens is that you end up not using that index because you're trying to like uh, look at only a subgraph. And again, your graph is organized by semantic uh, similarity, or in this case, represented by like the, the vector embeddings and not by time. And so you end up with slow queries because what happens is that you may be able to do a time filter, but then you just resort to doing a, a brute force uh, exact nearest neighbor search in the second step of performing the similarity search. And that often you know, can take a lot of time and lead to slow, slow queries. So now that we understand the problem, I want to understand these two approaches. It kind of looks like you know this pre-filtering approach here, this looks pretty good. We kind of want something like this, but we want to do it in an optimized way. And so that's what we set out to do at timescale. Um, and, you know, we, we created this product called Timescale Vector. It's actually recently released in the past month. And um, 
you know, I'm going to take you through right now about how we solve this uh, hybrid search, uh, this, uh, sorry, this time-based uh, retrieval search problem using some of the capabilities uh, that we introduce in the time series uh, database product uh, and combining that with vector data to enable this uh, unique uh, time-based retrieval capabilities, but in a very efficient manner. So timescale vector, you know, one thing to take away from this presentation today is that timescale vector is a database for vector relational and time series data. So it basically combines uh, all, the, uh, all the, the features of a time series database, a relational database, and lets you handle vector uh, data as well. And so what, uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit and tell you about timescale vector in general, and then we can zoom back in to the time-based search capabilities and I'll show you how we kind of uh, solve that in, uh, in timescale vector. So just for your general knowledge, you know, what is Timescale Vector? Uh, it's one cloud Postgres database for vector relational and time series data. You know, uh, over here, uh, we basically take Postgres and extend it for time series data using the Timescale DB extension. And then we extend it further using a PG Vector and our own uh, extension for handling vector data. So let's see what that looks like uh, in, a, in a diagram. So the first step is uh, a cloud data platform. So Timescale Vector is a cloud database. Uh, it has all the good things like HA and replicas and uh, SSO and all that stuff. Uh, then we have um, the Postgres database. So each Timescale Vector database is a Postgres database, and this allows you to store relational data. And then you also get a Timescale DB uh, extension added on, which gives you time series capabilities. One of the capabilities that we're particularly interested in is this idea of automatic partitioning by time. Now, this is something that, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you take the capabilities of a time series database, you're often querying data by time. And so you want to organize your data in such a way that it's really efficient to query it uh, by time. Uh, and this automatic partitioning by time is what, uh, what we, uh, one of the capabilities that we introduce. So on top of that, uh, we have some of the vector capabilities. So you get PG vector indexes and the vector type. And then Timescale Vector adds its own search index uh, inspired by the disk NN algorithm, as well as some capabilities for hybrid search uh, by metadata and time filters, which is you know, what we're talking about today. And then we have these integration and libraries, uh, one of which is Llama Index uh, to allow you to basically take advantage of all the optimizations uh, in the frameworks that you use to build your app. Okay, so now that you understand what is Timescale Vector, basically it's this cloud Postgres database that can handle vector relational time series data. Let's take a look at how uh, you can actually efficiently uh, time filter vectors by using Timescale DB's capabilities. And uh, this uh, insight here is that, like, you know, if you actually associate uh, time with a vector, you can actually utilize some of the time series capabilities in order to really uh, speed up this time filtering. And one of the key abstractions that we introduce in time in Timescale DB and one of the key time series features is this idea called a hyper table. So uh, those of you who might know uh, MySQL or Postgres uh, might know the concept of tables. A table is just something that you uh, st you store your data in a table. Uh, and a hyper table, basically, what it is is that it's a collection of smaller tables. So you can imagine, you know, each of these little uh, uh, chunks here are themselves tables. And what happens is that timescale vector, when uh, data is ingested into the database, it gets automatically partitioned by time into uh, these uh, smaller tables, uh, we call them chunks. So each of these tables uh, will contain data that's for a specified period of time. Maybe it's seven days, maybe it's 30 days, maybe it's one year, the user can actually specify that. And what happens is that when you actually uh, query the, the, the database, you query it as if it's the single table. So that's why it's called a hyper table. So you query the hyper table. But under the hood, what happens is that when you're doing these time-based queries, the database will uh, know and exclude certain chunks or certain subtables that are not relevant. So for example, it'll know like, hey, I only want to search you know, this, uh, these subtables for the query, and we don't have to worry about all the other ones because that's going to be efficient. So that gives you some intuition for hyper tables, and this is kind of the key feature that we leverage. And so what we do when we do efficient time-based vector search and timescale vector is really leverage this hyper table capability. So the first thing we do is 
the data isn't just stored in a single table, but it's stored in this hyper table. So when you ingest it, it the data gets automatically partitioned by time into these smaller chunks. Uh, so these are, once again, this is, when I say chunk, I really just mean the sub table here. Then what happens is that we create uh, an approximate nearest neighbor index on each chunk. So rather than the index be for all of your data, we create it on a per chunk basis so that each of these sub tables here have their own AN and search index. And then what happens when you do a search, we can then perform the pre-filtering really efficiently because now we only need to look at the uh, chunks that match the time predicate and we can filter out the chunks that don't. Uh, so pre-filtering that, that critical step is really efficient and you can perform the similarity search using the ANN index because those indexes are on a per uh, chunk level rather than uh, for all of your data. And then what happens is that, sorry, I went too quickly. So you perform the similarity search and then you can combine and re-rank your results from the search using a merge sort in order to get uh, both efficient time-based search, but also take advantage of that approximate nearest neighbor index. So that's a little bit of theory for you. Um, some background for some of the uh, you know key capabilities that we introduce in Timescale Vector and why this idea of time-based retrieval is kind of tricky when you dig into the system internals. Uh, and we managed to you know, come up with a solution that we uh, offer through Timescale Vector. So now that you understand some of the theory behind this, let's take a look at how you can actually implement time-based retrieval in your RAG system using uh, our favorite data framework, Llama Index, and Timescale Vector as your vector database. Um, so I'm going to cover the following things uh, that we, uh, we at Timescale Vector offer in Llama Index uh, in order to make time-based retrieval really easy. So this is uh, an overview, and then I'll go through each of them one by one. Uh, let me just take a sip of tea. Okay, so the first one is we need to have this uh, notion of time in our nodes. So nodes are these you know, first-class citizens in Llama Index. So we need to be able to create, uh, have some time component in them. And what Timescale Vector does is allows you to create nodes with time-based UUID. So we'll cover how to do that. Second, you want to load your node into the vector store and you want to enable auto partitioning. The good news is this is like a one line uh, setting that you enable. So we'll cover that. Thirdly, you know, adding vectors, sorry, adding the index to the vector store, you want to create that those indexes on the, the sub tables. This is again, you know, one line procedure. Uh, and then we allow you to do similarity search We're using a time filter. And then some of the more interesting things performing uh, RAG with the timescale vector store as a vector store retriever and or a query engine. And then in my opinion, the most interesting thing is performing a uh, RAG using the vector index auto retriever where rather than specifying the uh, time filter parameters yourself, you can basically let the LLM infer that from a user query. So now this is an overview, let's take a look at the code for each one of them. Um, and once again, you know, at the end of this presentation, I will send you, uh, I will give you a link for where you can find all of this code uh, to use in your applications. Uh, for now, I've just put, uh, uh, you know, these images of, of the code blocks on the screen. Um, so you don't have to take a screenshot or anything. These, uh, I'll send you the GitHub repo uh, at the end of this presentation. Okay, so the first one is time-based UUID. So the first idea here is like, you wanna have um, the notion of time in your node. And so what we do is there's a function over here to create a node. Um, we want to, uh, in the ID for that node, have a uh, time uh, baked in. So we use this uh, UUID type called UUID v1. And what we have is in the library, uh, in the timescale vector Python client library, this function uh, called UUID from time, which takes a daytime object and returns a UUID that you can then use excuse me, uh, that you can then use as an ID for your node in uh, Llama index. Okay, one good uh, good piece of news is that you only need to worry about this if you want to create nodes with time stamps in the past. So this is like past data. If you're like dealing with data and you wanna have the current data and time associated with it, uh, you can just create a node uh, as you normally would uh, using, um, uh, using Llama index. And when it gets inserted into timescale vector, uh, we automatically create a UID with the current date and time. So you only have to go through the step if you want to associate a time and date in the past. Uh, and again, you know, it's really easy. 
uh, there's a function that we provide to create this UID from time, uh, and that's how you can implement it. So once you've done that, what you want to do is load your nodes into timescale vector. And uh, you want to do this in such a way that that auto partitioning that I described, excuse me, in the previous section is automatically enabled. And as you can see, you know, Llama index provides a really easy way to create uh, vector stores. Um, what you want to do here is you know, import the timescale vector store and then uh, initialize it here with the service URL, which is, you know, as I mentioned, it's a cloud Postgres database. You get a URL to your service. You set your table name. And then the most important part is to set a time partition interval. So this would be the uh, you know, amount of time that you want each of these subtables to be uh, representing. And in this example, you use seven days, but you should pick a value that uh, makes sense for your use case. Maybe if you're querying data over decades, then you want that to be like, you know, one year or something like that. Or if you're querying data, you know, in the in the time span of like days and months, you want to have it be, uh, you know, in 30 minutes or in 60 minutes or something like that. And so once you've set that to the time delta that you want, uh, you just add the nodes to the uh, vector store and timescale vector under the hood takes care of automatically partitioning it into the different subtables. Uh, you don't have to worry about any of that. So that's how you load the data into the vector store. Then adding the vector store, uh, adding the index to timescale vector uh, is actually just a one line, um, one line operation. Uh, you just run this create index, um, create index uh, command and uh, it will add the timescale vector index, uh, in this case as a discaining index to your uh, vector store. And once again, you know, that index is gonna be um, created on a per chunk basis in order to take advantage of uh, the time-based filtering. Uh, we also offer other index types. So there's HNSW and there's IVF flat, both from PG vector. Uh, but in this example, I'm just using the default one, which is the timescale vector disk in an index. So that's the indexing part, you know, one line of code. And then we get to the similarity search. So I'll walk through this, uh, you know, part by part. If you want to perform a similarity search, what you first got to do is define your query string. So in this case, I'm asking, you know, what's new with timescale DB functions. Uh, then you want to have some sort of filter variables for your query. So you can either have uh, timescale vector provides three ways to filter, um, for, to perform a similarity search with time filters. So in this case, I've got the start date as the 1st of August, the end date as the 30th of August, and then a time delta of seven days, we'll see these different combinations. Then what you do is create, whoops, then what you do is create a vector store query in this step here. And then there's three different ways that you can actually do the similarity search. So the first way is you define a start date and an end date uh, and pass those as arguments. So when you have uh, this, when you query your vector store, you'd pass in the vector store query, but then you'd also pass in the start date and end date, uh, which is a start date and end date that we defined above. And that constrains the search to only uh, vectors within that start date and end date. The second method to do it is you can return the most similar vectors to a query from a particular start date and a time delta later. So in this case, uh, you define, instead of passing in the start and end date, you'd pass in a time delta. In this case, it would be like, you know, from the 1st of August and seven days later, but it could be, you know, end days and arbitrary amount of time later. Uh, some queries, uh, you know, do fit that, uh, that form quite well. And then, you know, another common one is, you know, uh, finding this this common form of query is good for finding like recent events or recent news and things like that, where you define uh, an end date and a time delta earlier. So in this case, it's like from the 30th of August and seven days earlier. Uh, this is useful for finding, you know, recent news, recent events, things like that. So that's how you do the similarity search with a time filter. You can get a bit more complex by using the retriever and the query engine. And in this case, you do everything that I uh, did over here by uh, creating your uh, timescale vector store and creating an index. Uh, you create an index here. And then all you do is when you create the retriever, you need to specify this vector store keyword args uh, argument and you set your start date and your end date here. Uh, and then very similarly, when you initialize your query engine, you must uh, make sure to set this uh, vector store keyword args uh, so that the query engine knows which start and end dates to use.
Okay, so this is how you would do it. Uh, you know, if you uh, just want to take advantage of the time-based similarity search and using Llama index, I'm going to get into this uh, idea that we actually just implemented this yesterday. So this is very exciting. Uh, this is the auto retriever, and Alex asked, "Is there a way to let the LLM decide if it, it should care about the time frame depending on the question asked?" And this is exactly that capability where you actually let the LLM infer the time filter from the user query. And there's like two steps in order to enable this. So the first one is uh, you need to set your vector store info. And this is basically telling the LLM, uh, hey, tell me about your schema and your metadata. So tell me about all the different fields. Tell me like, you know, what type they are. How do, how do I like basically give me some information so that I can know uh, when to use this. Uh, you know, personifying uh, GPD-4 for a second there. Then uh, what we do is we'd want to use this uh, vector index auto retriever. And what we do is we pass a couple of things to it. The first one is we pass the vector store info that we set on the slide uh, before this. Uh, once again, I'll give you the code so you can uh, dig into it a bit more. And then, then you, what you do is you essentially want to build a query engine from that. So then we build the query engine from our uh, vectors, vector index auto retriever. And then what we do is we actually give it, uh, we convert the query engine to be a tool for an open AI agent to then leverage uh, and interact with the vector store. So this piece of code here basically converts the query engine to a tool. And then what we do is we create this agent uh, that's then going to uh, answer our questions um, and we give it access to the tool here. So we say, you know, the tools is going to be the query engine tool. And then when we want to answer the question, we can chat with the chat engine and we make sure that it can have this function call available to it of query engine tool. So what actually happens then is that uh, the OpenAI agent can understand both the vector store information that we pass to it and it uh, has the ability to query the vector database. And so when you are answering a user query, it's a two-step process. So you make two open AI calls. The first one is to, uh, you know, given a user query and some query parameters, like what do we uh, ask? Like, what should our query be? Can you like tell me what filters and things that I should use? And then secondly, given that user query and some results from the vector store, what is the answer? Can you perform a completion? That's kind of the rad portion of it. So that's the theory of the auto retriever. Uh, does this tool also work with Llama models? That's probably a question for Jerry uh, at the end of this. Uh, I think so, maybe in the future. Uh, for now, we just use the OpenAI agent, uh, but we'll come to that at the end of this uh, at the end of this session. So that's the auto retriever at a high level. Once again, you know, I will get into the code and things uh, in the resources section. Uh, for the next five minutes or so, I'm just going to give you a small demo of what we call the Postgres time machine, which is showing you time-based uh, retrieval and RAG in action, where you can actually chat with the Git commit history. Uh, and this demo is built uh, with a few things. So just to give you a high-level overview, this, uh, as I said, Postgres time machine, you can chat with the Git commit history of the Postgres uh, database project. And we built this using Llama index as a data framework. Uh, Frontend is in Streamlit, and the vector database is timescale vector. So let me uh, exit out from this screen. Can everyone see the Streamlit app? Yes, okay. So this is a time machine. There's a couple of, um, you know, once again, I'll, I'll uh, link to the code and things like that for this so that you can fork this and play around with it. There's a couple of things that we have. So the first one is the ability to load data from a specific uh, Git repo. So right now on this hosted version that I'm using, that's disabled, but if you're running it locally, uh, there's instructions for how to load data from a repo that you're interested in. And then when you get to the actual chat interface, you can select which repo you want to uh, chat with. In this case, I only have one, which is Postgres. So I'm going to select that. Then we give users various knobs and dials in order to uh, define how many months back they want to search. So you can search uh, you know, up to 130 months back, which I think is just over 10 years. Uh, or if you set it at zero, it has no limit and it'll just search the whole uh, history that you have. And then you can also choose how many commits to retrieve. Uh, this is probably not something you'll expose to users, but for our demo purposes, we uh, we had this here. And so uh, let's go to the fun part. I'm going to first demo the auto query retriever and show you, you know, how the LLM uh, generates different results for different queries. So the first one is 
uh, let me make this a bit bigger. Hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, what changes were made to this feature called JIT in Postgres in 2022? So we'll just run that and see what the LLM says. You know, once again, under the hood, uh, what's happening is that first uh, the LLM is inferring what query filters to run. In this case, we wanna only have vectors from 2022. And then once you have that uh, query filter, it then performs a similarity search uh, to retrieve that and then does a uh, rag using those results. So let's give it a few seconds. Um, this is uh, one of the one of the parts of this that we, we need to improve, which is just making the completion faster, but you know, those two LLM calls taking place. So while this is working, let's just uh, wait a few minutes. I've personally noticed GPT-4 has been pretty slow lately, so it's not your fault. Yeah, Anyways, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks for thanks for the save there. Uh, so you can see here, yeah, this is using GPT-4 under the hood. Uh, we get a completion saying, you know, in 2022, these were the changes made it made, and then what it does is that in the commit, uh, in the the data that was retrieved, we have you know the author, and then we have the um, change description of what was made. So in this case, Andreas uh, Freund made changes to the function, uh, to the feature, and this is kind of what he did. And then the same with uh, this guy, Thomas Monroe, these are the changes they made. Uh, and you can kind of see that, hey, it references data from 2022. Uh, so, you know, it, it uh, you know, under the hood, it only constrains the such to that. Let's try the same query, but asking it about 2023. And let's see, you know, hopefully we get different results. So that's gonna run. Um, and you know what uh, what you can do is kind of uh, you know expose some of the thought processes to the users. We haven't done this in this case, um, but this is an example of uh, you know once again the auto retriever functionality in in action. So let's give it some time to think. While we're waiting, if folks want to like note down their questions in the chat. I see there's some, so that's good. Let's keep those coming. Uh, we'll answer them in a moment once this demo is done. There we go. Okay. So in this case, uh, you know, we can see uh, a little bit of different format this time. Um, and uh, these are the, just to compare, you know, what was said in 2022, we had uh, this guy, Andres Friend, making some, thing, making some changes, or tracking back LLVM changes. And in this case, we can see the, uh, both the people making the changes and the changes are different. So uh, we can kind of tell that the LLM, one is giving a correct answer, and then two, um, using vectors only from that time period as context for their answer. Uh, and you know the key thing here is this: this 2023 and 2022, and you know that's the power of the auto retriever, where the user can specify the filter in their question. And this is really useful. So, for example, like if you're building like a business analytics app, and you want your CEO or whoever in the company to know, like, hey, tell me about the performance in the past month. Uh, this is kind of a cool way to implement that capability, where people can specify what they're looking for in natural language, and then your LLM can then you know, get them the results uh, that they need inferring the filters. Uh, there's a lot, one more thing that I'll filter, that I'll demo, which is um, just about, uh, uh, yeah, just about like, you know, the LLM knowing like where, uh, when and um, inferring like when the first commit for something was. Um, so I'm gonna ask who made the first changes to JIT and when did this happen? So let's see what that gives us. Uh, you know, once again, you can play around with this for any repo you're interested in. I think the next version we should probably make is for Llama index itself, just to see, you know, when different features were added and what was some of the things behind it. Um, this is, I'm not sure if that's right actually, uh, but this is kind of the um, the answer that we get. And you know, once again, you can play around with the how many months back you want to search and how many commits you want to retrieve. Uh, for the sake of time and, and answering false questions, I'm going to end the demo here. 
but uh, you can actually play around with this. Uh, all the code for this demo is in this uh, repo called the Vector Cookbook. And uh, it's in this folder called TSV Time Machine. You can fork this. And uh, there's instructions about how to basically set up your own version of this. And you can play around with it and explore uh, the code in, in more detail. Uh, so that's it for the short demo. Maybe if there's time later, we can get into more examples. But um, you know, just some next steps for you. You've obviously learned uh, a lot from this, uh, this webinar, hopefully. And here are some next steps to guide your learning. So the first one is a tutorial that we have in the Llama Index docs, which is about how to use the timescale vector store. And uh, there's a section there about performing similarity search with time-based filtering. So it goes through all the code that I covered and uh, gives you some commentary for how that works and, and how you can use that in Llama Index. Then, you know, as I just uh, showed you on the other screen, uh, you can try out the sample app yourself. Just go to this uh, timescale uh, vector cookbook repo on GitHub and you can find uh, the code to uh, clone and, and get started with from there. And then finally, uh, if you want to learn a bit more about Timescale Vector and Llama Index, uh, there's a guest blog that we did that Jerry published a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Llama Index blog that you can uh, learn more about. And uh, finally, you know, as a thank you for everyone attending this webinar today and everyone who signed up, uh, we're giving Llama Index users 90 days free of Timescale Vector. So once again, it's a cloud Postgres database. So your database is in the cloud. Uh, and you get 90 days free to play around with it. You can actually use it to spin up the sample app that I showed. Uh, and you can go to the URL on the screen in front of you, which is timescale.com slash AI to claim that. Uh, and you can also find, uh, just navigating to the page really quick, in this resources section, uh, the tutorials, uh, both for Llama Index and then also this, um, let me just refresh the page, this uh, vector cookbook, which uh, you can find uh, the, the sample app uh, living there. So that's it from me today. Uh, happy to get into your questions. Um, and really, uh, thank you so much again for uh, for having me on this uh, Lama Index webinar today. Awesome. After, thanks so much for the presentation. This is uh, one, really great. It was really polished. And two, it was a lot of stuff, uh, from both like the systems, like uh, time, time, like the, the part partitioning aspects, uh, all the way to LM based like auto retrieval. I, I think you showed a lot of cool use cases here. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I guess like in terms of the next steps, we could go through some of the audience questions first. Uh, and then if, if, um, if needed, I, I have a bunch of questions I, I can ask too. Awesome. So for the questions, if okay, I'd, I'll just read it out from the chat. Is that how you guys usually do it? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, cool. So um, the first one that I don't think we answered uh, live is from Ahmed, who asked, can I explain more about Market Reader? How are they keeping their vector database up to date? News are flowing in every millisecond. Are they using Llama Index to index real-time news and data? So a Market Reader, this is a great, again, you know, great question. Uh, they're a customer of Timescale. And uh, basically, I think they have these APIs and these uh, providers of news where they actually ingest real-time streams of news, and they store that time series data in hypertables in TimescaleDB itself. So uh, that's one use case. And then what they do is they vectorize that, those, that news uh, into a, a embedding using, uh, I think, the OpenAI model, and um, then they can perform some rarity search on that. Uh, in terms of if they're using Llama Index or not, I actually am not sure. I need to double check with them. Uh, I can't remember since the last time I spoke, but if they're not, I'll definitely recommend it to them uh, to use. But I think definitely you can use Llama Index, you know, using the uh, approaches that I talked about in this session today. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that uh, that provides more color on that question. Um, then Alex asks, can Timescale be used with any Postgres instance, for example, AWS Aurora? So Timescale DB, uh, the way it works is that it's a Postgres extension. There's actually two, um, you know, to, to answer your question, the best way to use Timescale is uh, on our cloud-hosted product, uh, plug for my employers there, uh, you know, obviously using the product that the folks who built the, the extension built is kind of the best way to get the latest and greatest of, uh, of Timescale. But uh, you know, you can self-host TimescaleDB as well. There is a community version, which is free. Uh, but for example, on AWS Aurora, you only get a limited feature set. So uh, you know, we do see a lot of folks actually switching over for the full feature set uh, from AWS Aurora, and you still get uh, you know, the same Postgres and the same Postgres ecosystem underneath. So hopefully that answers your question. You know, once again, you get 90 days free if you just want to check it out. 
uh, I encourage you to sign up and you know evaluate it for yourself. I think uh, Abu Bakar question... asks. Oh, oh, yeah, I go think, ahead. Um, oh, because because I think that the next like unanswered question, I think some of these have been have been answered, like in terms of go ahead uh, recording. The recording is on YouTube, uh, and so basically all all uh, these webinars get put on our YouTube channel, and so um it'll, it'll live on the internet forever uh, but it, it's basically good to, to kind of like um for, for especially if you want to look up a tutorial of how to use lama index with like time-based retrieval uh it'll be a good resource there um and then i awesome. think uh alex uh asked about like the the like auto retrieval basically which i think he, which i think you answered um and then the next piece uh that um i figured i would just take is um florian asks Perfect. does this tool use uh like also work with llama based models or basically any sort of open models. Um, one comment I'll make is that a lot of the concepts that after are described is more on the retrieval side. So time-based retrieval uh, that doesn't actually um, require the LLM in the loop. Uh, so if you basically just want to tune the retrieval portion with, with time-based filtering, you, you totally can. Um, and then the LLM is just responsible for the synthesis portion. In that case, I think llama models should work pretty well. Um, the one exception is like tool use through auto retrieval. If you actually want the LLM to infer the time-based filters, the LLM is responsible for actually producing like structured outputs that it can use to query the time, uh, the, the vector database. In that case, in that sense, like we have found open source models tend to not do as well as like GPT-4 uh, or stronger models in general. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, especially if you're interested in like the auto retrieval stuff. Awesome. Uh, there were some questions, uh, I think Adriano and April asked about the types of questions that you can ask. I'll say yes to both of them. Uh, it is possible to handle an uh, undefined amount of time. You know, it just searches the whole of the data set that you have in your database. So however much data back, that's the amount of time that you'll uh, search over. And then uh, April asked, you know, can you answer like when questions? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, in that case, I actually can't remember off the top of my head when JIT was introduced, so I'll double check that. But you know, yeah, in theory, that definitely does work. Um, yeah, and then there's some questions about you know, Jeff asked about the time scale to be open source version. Uh, you can try it. We actually uh, all our demos are using the databases uh, in the cloud hosted version. Uh, you know, once again, I'd recommend using that just because it's easy to get started with. But uh, you can try with open source version. Uh, I will say that the timescale vector capabilities, so the disk in -in index and some of the hybrid search capabilities that we offer are only available on the hosted product uh, just because we're trying to move quickly and that's the fastest way to get the software out there. Um, so, you know, you can, uh, you know, try whichever version makes sense for you there. Well, maybe one question I have actually is, um, especially in the time-based partitioning, how do you deal with um, document updates? Like for a given document, if uh, time represents like the last update time, how do you actually, and, and then let's say that that uh, update time changes because the contents got updated. How do you like re-index that document and rebalance like the partitions? Yeah, so what actually happens is we, we generally recommend and insert rather than an update pattern. Uh, so what actually happens is just creating a new uh, record in your database, just like insert it again. And then what we actually provide that some of the things that I didn't get into, we provide a bunch of data lifecycle features where you can actually automatically uh, tier data, compress data, in some cases, delete data older than a certain time period. And so this allows you to kind of maintain, uh, you know, make sure that your database doesn't bloat too much by having these like millions and billions of records. Um, in terms of how you like want to deal with uh, specific like document updates, I think like the cleanest way is just to insert a new record. And then uh, there's probably some, you know, uh, edge cases where, you know, you do actually want to perform the update. Uh, in terms of the table, uh, it will get uh, placed in the partition that uh, makes more sense for it. That happens under the hood. Uh, but in terms of the, and also in terms of the vector index, uh, you don't need to actually rebuild the index uh, that gets taken care of with the disk and algorithm as a new, uh, new, um, uh, sorry, new embeddings are, are added to the database. Got it. Uh, so that yeah. hopefully that you know gives some insight. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think the follow up the follow up question here is, I think Alex actually asked this as well as like, is there a way to avoid like? Duplicates. I think I've actually heard this from a variety of users where um, oftentimes like maybe the same database will have like outdated information as well as like kind of new and more recent information. 
And I'm curious if there's ways to handle that at the system level for, for time scale. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, again, this is where it really depends on like your application level needs. Like most of the time, do you actually want to keep around the old record? That's a question that, you know, some applications do for like auditing purposes, other applications, uh, maybe not. Uh, so I think like basically what you want is, uh, you know, answer those questions for yourself. And then I think, um, you know, one way that you can do it is uh, to have uh, in the um, in the time in the time period like a way to basically flag to say hey use the most updated version of this data and one way to do that is to actually tier data from uh, one table to another another way is to actually use uh, we have a data tiering functionality that actually tiers data that is infrequently accessed to Amazon S3 so uh, you can still keep it accessible from the database, but there's an option to turn that uh, retrieval from S3 off. So you can only actually query data that's inside the database. There's multiple ways that you can implement it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to give an absolute answer just because like I've seen so many different edge cases and, uh, you know, it really just depends on what your application requirements are. So yeah, there is a way to avoid duplicates. You're going to have to do a little bit of... Um, you know, work working around for that. You know, one easy way to do it is just to use an upset that also works. Uh, if you if you don't care about the old value, but if you want to keep the old value, then you know, there's a few decisions you have to make there. I see. Cool. Thanks for the info. Um, yeah. The, the, uh, this, uh, I have another well, question actually. Oh, but it's, it's, sorry. Are you going to say? I was just going to say. Uh, Florian asked a question. Yeah. I'm just reading it. Are LLMs good at scheduling replanning? based on time events chunks. I'm not sure what that means, Florian. Can you can you just explain that in the chat? Um yeah, I actually I'm not sure what you what you're getting at there, unfortunately. Uh, you, you had a question though in the meantime, Jerry. Oh yeah. I well I figure for this question it's probably more related to just like um something around like uh the auto retrieval piece. Uh I'm, I'm actually not sure. Uh, but but we can we can get back to it as well. Um the uh question I was gonna ask is like is there like a preferred um, timestamp representation? Um, like, is is all all data like kind of indexed? Is it like um, like epoch time? Is it like that that date like date um, the year month day format? Uh, does that yeah. matter actually? So it actually doesn't matter. Let me just uh, whoops, sorry. Let me go back to one of the slides that I had actually, uh, which is the slide here. I accidentally closed the chat. So let me open that up. Uh, so basically. Whoops, it's not this one. It's actually this one here. Yeah, so basically what happens, and this is specifically for Llama Index, for if you're just using timescale without Llama Index, uh, you can use, uh, pr the preferable one is timestamp Z, uh, or timestamp TZ that has a timestamp and a time zone associated with it. It's a Postgres uh, timestamp data type. For Llama Index, what we recommend folks to do and the way that we've implemented this is actually uh, by using a UUID uh, v1, I think. Yeah, UID v1 uh, that actually has a daytime portion in it. And so what we do is, uh, you know, most of the time uh, users don't really, uh, you know, you, you have to have an ID. And so what we thought is, hey, if you have to have an ID anyway, and we want to have unique times for uh, an object and the ID kind of uniquely identifies a, a node in this case, uh, why don't we kind of leverage that? And so what we do is, uh, we use this uh, UUID uh, v4 to say, hey, if you have a time in the past, you can create a UUID from a daytime object. And then when you're actually creating your node, uh, you can specify, hey, use that UUID that I just created as the node ID. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you don't care about uh, having a time in the past associated with it, if you like, you know, want to have the current date and time associated with it, when you uh, create your node or when you adjust, uh, there's a function to like add nodes to the uh, vector store uh, in Llama index, uh, it'll automatically create this UID v1 with the current date and time under the hood. And that's only if you enable this time partitions option here. Uh, if that's off, it'll just use the standard UID that Llama index uses. But if you enable time-based partitioning, that's kind of how we take care of it. Uh, so, you know, to answer your question, the key thing here is to use that UUID v1 as your node ID is uh, in Llama index, uh, that 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 that's my recommendation there. Great, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And and then I think for the rest of the um, 
uh, the, the rest of the webinar, we probably just uh, go through our last two questions and and um, and and go from there. Um, so I think Matthias asked, sure. uh, how does filtering in TimeScale DB compare to quadrant filtering? <laughs> Spicy question. Um, how are currently filtering quadrant based on time. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't looked at how quadrant does filtering. I you know spent. Uh... Uh, you know, a couple, a couple of sections in the webinar talking about how timescale does it again, the automatic partitioning by time. Um, that's something we can definitely look into. I think, you know, um, again, I'm not uh, super familiar with how Quadrant does it, but I will say, you know, something in general is that timescale started off as uh, a company that was focused just on time series use cases. And so what we're leveraging here is a uh, functionality that was built specifically for time series data. And uh, that is uh, kind of what we're leveraging. So we do have the advantage of, you know, having a lot of experience dealing with time-based data and efficiently retrieving uh, and efficiently searching over it. Um, that I'm not sure if, if Quadrant does have those same kinds of capabilities. So that's my, you know, face value answer. Again, I'll have to dig into the details and uh, happy to you know chat offline about that. Right. Um, and, and, and then I think the last yeah, question is just like, um, could you share the like? I guess could you share the hit rate of this technique? And I guess the implication there is just like when you do this like time based retrieval uh, and and do like A and N with like the the time based partitioning. Like, is there kind of like an accuracy component? Like, uh, is there like some parts where like by tuning the the um, time partition, you actually might get like slightly different results and ways to think about that? So. I think that um, the ANN index part is, I, I I would say that in some in this case, if so, if you think about like accuracy of the results, which is like, you know, one there's two components. One is you know, does this result actually fall into the time period that I'm interested in, and then two, you know, is it actually semantically relevant to the query that I'm asking? So if we take the first component, uh, this technique has a very high hit rate because once again, you're only examining these subtables, these chunks that are uh, within the time period of your interest because the data has been automatically partitioned by time. And we use this thing called chunk exclusion to exclude chunks outside the query time range. So that's the first component. The second component, uh, it depends on the index type that you're using. So in timescale vector, the standard index is a disk in an index. And you can set those parameters. There's actually a blog post. Uh, if you go to the timescale, uh, timescale.com slash AI website, there's a blog that describes uh, the actual index type that we use. And you can set certain parameters to basically make this trade-off between uh, accuracy and query speed. Uh, the benchmark that we have in the blog uses the accuracy threshold of 99% uh, and shows the query speed at that, uh, at that threshold. Uh, but if you want to have you know, 99.999%, there's, uh, there's certain parameters that you can change. I don't want to get into it too much now because it varies uh, for the disk NN one, for the HNSW one. But in the blog, we actually discuss, hey, if you want higher accuracy, this is what you should set it to. And if you want higher query speed at the expense of accuracy, you should set it to something else. And then we give you like a default that has a happy middle ground at around 99% accuracy. Um Sweet. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That was actually a question I was going to ask, you, which is like the, the trade off between the, the query speed and the accuracy. Um, OK, awesome. Uh, I, I think we'll end it there because we're about at time uh, uh, an hour. And thanks so much Avatar, for the great presentation and, and answering all the questions. Um, we'll have the recording up on YouTube as well uh, to, to share with the rest of the world. But this is great. And, and um, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.